All right, welcome back. This lecture is going to be on section uh, 1.4, which is on rational expressions. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with that, uh, and uh, we'll see where we get to. Um, so rational expressions, we learned last time in 1.3, rational expressions sort of uh, bring polynomials to a whole nother level. Um, they allow us to, the, to or they are rather, um, the fractions where polynomials are used as the numerators and the denominators. So again, a rational expression is a polynomial, like I'll call it polynomial number one, divided by polynomial number two. If we take two polynomials and we just make a fraction of them, we've got ourselves a rational expression. And rational expressions are a, a bit more complicated than just a polynomial, right? Um, but uh, there's certain things that we can we can you know use them for, and so they're they're really they're really handy. I used uh, just last summer I used rational expressions to help me when I was building a fence. You know, you put slats up on a fence like this. I was putting some space in between each of the slats for my fence that I was building last summer and uh, I used rational expressions to help me figure out how big those spacings needed to be uh, given the width of my boards and the length of the fence and the number of boards that I wanted to put on a wall. So rational expressions, very practical. You wouldn't even think twice about it, right? You would. Well, maybe maybe I wouldn't think twice about using them. Maybe you wouldn't go first to rational expressions, but I certainly did. And so they're very practical in helping you figure out pre precise things like that, um, if, if you want that precision. First thing that we're going to talk about, though, uh, is something called domain. Uh, the domain of a function, the domain of an expression. In lay terms, I like to call this allowed input. Okay, the allowed inputs. Um, formally, it's the set of all real numbers. So every real numbers, every real number rather, that a variable is permitted. Permitted. One or two T's. Oh boy, I'm pretty sure it's two. Permitted. Hopefully the internet is kind. Pretty sure it's two. So it's the set of all real numbers that a variable is permitted. That's why I like to call it the allowed input. Right? If I gave you just a rational expression like this, one over, and one is a polynomial, it's a zero degree polynomial, just a constant, divided by x minus one, and I asked you, you know, what numbers might you be allowed to plug in? Uh, you'd look at that and you'd say, well, what can I divide one by? Can I divide one by six or seven or, you know, any number? And the answer is almost, you can almost divide one by any number. The only one you have to be careful of is zero, right? So one over zero is not something that you can do. It's not something you're permitted to do. So then the question is, for the rational function I gave you, what is its domain? Well, it's the set of all real numbers that don't give you division by zero in this case. So it's every real number without one. So we can write that down like this, r minus the set of one. We can write that down in interval notation. It's negative infinity to one together with one to infinity. We could write it down in set builder notation, all x's, such that x is not equal to 1. <laughs> right, there's several ways we can write this. 
but the, the point here we're making is what are the numbers that we can plug in? What is the domain for this rational expression? It's every real number except one because one is not permitted because it causes division by zero. Okay. There's, there's other things that you might run into, something like this, um, you know, uh, uh, x over uh, x squared minus 5x plus 6. You know, this is a, a little bit of a harder one when you're trying to find the domain of this because answering the question of where does this equal 0 is a little bit harder. But from the last section, we can, we can always factor things, right? x minus 3, x minus 2. That's a factoring of x squared minus 5x plus 6. And now we can use the zero property that says it if the product of two numbers, or any number of numbers, is zero, then at least one of them must be zero. So this gives us the result that either x is 3, x is 2, or both, which I get is technically impossible. It can't be both, right? But there's the possibility that it could be either because we don't know what x is. So we see in this problem that the domain is every real number without 2 and 3. We can't plug those in because if we do, the denominator is 0. Okay? We could write that separately or differently, all real numbers x, such that x does not equal 2 or 3. We could write it in interval notation, uh, negative infinity to 2, together with 2 to 3, together with 3 to infinity. So these are, this is the domain of this rational expression. Now, there's, there's not a whole lot more left to do except to talk about how you can multiply and divide and how you can simplify rational expressions. And so um, instead of giving you, you know, the long, complicated version, there's this really easy version which says if you have any fraction like this where there's a common factor on top and bottom, you can cancel them out. Okay, so when you're dealing with a rational expression, it pays, it pays dividends to factor them out, the, the numerator and the denominator. So like I did in the previous problem to solve for the domain, it turns out you're going to be doing that a lot. Um, you're going to be factoring rational expressions as much as you can in order to simplify them as much as you can. Um, and so a nice easy example is We'll just take x squared minus 1, and we'll divide it by, uh, we'll just do x minus 1. How's that? Uh, you know what? We can make it squared. Why not? So the bottom's already factored, right? It's x minus 1 times x minus 1, but the top is not. So let's factor that. That's a special pattern from 1.3. It's a difference of perfect squares, which we know factors like this. We know on bottom it was already factored. So what do we see? We've got common factors here, x minus 1 and x minus 1 in a product on top and bottom. So they cancel out. So this rational expression simplifies to just x plus 1 over x minus 1. The domain of this is x cannot equal 1. It's all reals all real numbers x such that x is not 1, or it's all real numbers without the set of 1, or it's negative infinity to 1, 1 to infinity, any union. Okay. How do you multiply rational expressions? It's no different than fractional multiplication, right? a over b times c over d. It's just you multiply the tops, you multiply the bottoms, and you've got a new fraction of the products, right? It's no different from fraction multiplication because a rational expression is just a fraction of numbers. We just don't know what those numbers are, so we use variables to represent them. x minus 1 over x plus 1 times x squared plus 1 over x cubed plus 2. 
This is just two fractions of numbers multiplied together. We don't know what they are because we don't know what x is. But the result is just x minus 1 times x squared plus 1 over x plus 1 over x cubed plus 2. Done. Okay. To multiply rational expressions, it's no different than multiplying fractions. You just, you know, you just multiply across the top and bottom, and that's that's the that's the whole story. It's the same thing with fractional. Uh, sorry, with with division of rational expressions as well. If you have one fraction divided by another, you remember what I said from section one point one. I think 1.1. Nobody divides fractions. Everybody multiplies. And this, the, the pattern was flip and multiply. So we take the second fraction, we take its reciprocal, we flip it over, and we multiply. Okay, this is true. A over B divided by C over D is, in fact, A over B times D over C. We know from the previous rule that this is just A times D over B times C. Right? No matter what these things are, they can be, they can be polynomials that we've multiplied together. They can be uh, numbers that we've multiplied together. It doesn't matter what they are. Um, this pattern holds. So I'm not going to do much of an example there, um, except just maybe to, to just do one little thing. x over x plus 1 divided by, okay, divided by, uh, let's do 2x minus 1 over x plus 1. We flip the second one and multiply times x plus 1 over 2x minus 1. So we get this, but before we do that I want to I want to just say we've got common factors on top and bottom, so I'm not even going to not even going to cancel them out to begin with because we're still learning this. I just wanted to point that out. You could cancel them out at that point if you wanted. You could cancel them out at this point if you wanted. But the point is, we flipped and multiplied, and we've got our final result. And maybe some simplification needs to happen, but that's that's what you're doing in, in fraction division, right? Okay. And now, the hard one is adding and subtracting. <coughs> so. We had this nice problem in previous sections where we were adding fractions, or rational expressions now, that had the same denominator. Then the result was just the sum of the numerators divided by the same denominator that the other two fractions had, right? So what do you do if there is no common denominator? Well, in previous ones, we would multiply by a clever one to force each fraction to have the same denominator, and then we would apply this rule. So what does that look like <clears throat> with rational expressions? Okay, well here we go. Let me give you a, a weird one. X plus or x over y plus one. Yeah, this is a y, this is not another x, it's a y plus one. got a rational expression, x over y, plus another rational expression. But it doesn't look like it, does it? Right? It looks like a number. <laughs> Technically, that's 1 over 1. But they don't have the same denominator. So how do we force it to have the same denominator? We need to introduce it. You know, we need this to be a y so that we can 
add across the numerators. So we, just like before, multiply by a clever 1. In this case, it's y divided by y. It's the factors in the left fraction that do not exist in this fraction's denominator multiplied on top and bottom. So this gives us now this expression, x over y plus y over y. Now we can apply the rule. We, multi we add across the numerators, we divide by the common denominator. So x over y plus 1 is x plus y over y. This is a way to turn uh, you know, a sum of rational expressions that don't have the same denominator uh, into just a fraction, which you can you know, invert and multiply or <clears throat> do other things with. Okay. This can look a little bit, a little bit stranger, right? Um, we could have harder denominators. something like this. But the basic idea remains the same. You look at each of the denominators and you look for the least common multiple. You look for the, 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 the expression that has all of the factors of both denominators. So we see two factors here, x plus 1 and x minus 1. So I'm going to create a list. Okay, so that's the factors of the first denominator. Now I'm going to go to the next fraction denominator, and I'm going to create a list of its. I'm going to add to this list that I've got. I'm going to add to it factors that appear in the second fraction, but not in the first. And there are none, right? We see that this already exists right there. So this is the least common denominator that we're going for. We make a list of all the factors. Only the number of times they appear, right? Uh, we make a list of them, and that is the least common denominator. If I had something like this, you know, it's x minus 3, something else here, I would notice when I first listed these factors, here they are, um, that there was no x minus 3. x plus 1 is already listed once, so we've got that here, once, but there's no x minus 3, so I would just multiply it on to the end here. And actually I'll continue with this because this is this is good. So this is our least common denominator now. So how do we force um, both fractions to have the same denominator as we multiply them both by one. But that one is going to be the fraction of the missing the missing uh, factors in the least common denominator. So on the left-hand fraction, what factor are we, mi are we missing? We're missing x minus 3. So I'm going to multiply by x minus 3 over x minus 3. In the right-hand denominator, which factor are we missing? We're missing x minus 1. So I'm going to multiply by x minus 1 over x minus 1. Okay. And now if you look at the denominators, both of them are this same thing, okay? Which means when we go to add these two guys together, we can just add across the numerators. x times x minus 3 plus y times x minus 1, and then divide by the common denominator, x plus 1 x minus 1, x minus 3. And that's it. There might be some simplification to take care of here, but, but that's it. OK, the next and last thing that I'm, I think I'm going to talk about here for this section is rationalizing denominators or numerators. So um, I'll just go with an example here. So here we've got a rational expression, um, rational num uh, sorry, a uh, 
it's not a rational number, uh, and it, it's not a rational expression. It's a number that has a root in the denominator, an irrational number in the denominator. Um, I want to teach you how to turn that denominator into a, a rational number when um, when there's a sum there. We've done this before when there was no sum, right? And it usually involved multiplying by almost exactly, depending on the situation. Uh, it multiply it involved multiplication by a clever one that sort of completed the root. So here you've got completing this square root means you just need to square the result. Here we've got a cubed root, so we need to make sure we've got something cubed on the bottom. So you multiply by something else. But what do you do when there's a sum or a difference in there, like we've got here? Turns out you need to apply this rule. If you remember, a plus b, a minus b, multiplied together, gives you a squared minus b squared. It's the square of both things. You see, here we've got 1 plus root 2. In order to turn that into something squared, right, to square the square root, we can multiply it by what we call its conjugate, 1 minus root 2, on top and bottom. And that results in the squaring of both those terms, the 1 and the root 2. Right, when you square square root of 2, you get just 2. So this is a nice way to rationalize this, this pattern. It's a nice way to rationalize square roots in the, nom in the denominator or in the numerator. Um, and uh, this, this is the pattern that it's, it's based on. So we've got 1 minus root 2 over 1 minus 2, which is negative 1 which actually gets rid of the entire fraction. It's negative 1 plus root 2. Okay, so no more fractions at all. Okay, and with that, that's it. Um, working with rational expressions, which are just fractions of polynomials, they're get, they get complicated, uh, but you can simplify them by factoring uh, the numerators and denominators, canceling out common factors. And it turns out that uh, you can use some of the patterns that we've used before, uh, in you know, like you've seen here, to rationalize denominators or rationalize numerators, depending on you know the uh, the whims of the person asking you questions. Uh, but that's it for section 1.4, and I'll see you next time for section 1.5.